So this is a little different podcast. I've done a couple of these lately. I like them. I hope you do too. But what I've done is, you know, I've actually been with an artist when I'm at their opening, you know, and they're talking about their show. And that's what happened with Howard Post. It was a very wonderful time to celebrate Howard as an artist. He was the Desert Caballeros Artist of the Year, had a big museum show for him. The show's already down, but it lives on through this podcast, and that's why it's so important, I think, on ones like this, when I do do them, to, I think they're much en enriched and, and fuller if you watch the video component, just because you can see the paintings we're talking about. You know, I think we see and learn a few things that even I didn't know uh, about Howard, and that can happen too, right? It's one thing to talk to somebody in the studio. It's another thing to be in front of a painting, or in this case, numerous paintings over a lifetime's worth of work, and be able to go, ah, I see that now, right? I get it. Or it just, you know, that human interaction with art allows even the artist to maybe see things that he didn't see, and, you know, because I see it in a little different way. So it's a very interesting one, and I know it was good because his wife Marilyn said, Ah, we really want this for our kids and grandkids. They'll really love it. So there's something there of, of uh, real value. And he's an important artist, clearly. So I'm here with Howard Post, and we're at the Desert Caballeros, and this is a retrospective of his work. Very important thing for Howard. And, you know, this is in his first retrospective. It won't be his last, but it's a great one. He's got some of the most iconic imagery in the show. One of them is actually, this is my son's piece, which was done for the movie Flicka, and I thought maybe Howard could just tell us a little bit about the Tim McGraw yeah. movie. Yeah, so the producers contacted Mark. Uh, saying that they liked my work and wanted to... Mark being me. Yes, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they uh, wanted to use uh, some imagery of my work in, in the movie as props. And so uh, I had done two or three pieces that they liked and considered for the movie. And yeah. I'm not sure exactly which one ended up in the film for about 10 seconds. Yes, know. I was in there though. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so, it wasn't so. this one because... The one that was in it, I think we sold, and this one my son snagged. Yeah. So, so but it was fun to have that little notoriety there for a minute, to a slice <laughs> of history, and uh, that's a kind of a cool painting. I'm glad Charles has it. So, yeah, so. me too. It's a wonderful. And as Tim Newton had said in an earlier little video we talked about, <coughs> the horses really are purple. So, <laughs> so I'd like to move to this next painting if we could. This one is actually we loaned from the gallery. And one of the things I really love about this painting is that, you know, it, there's a modern sensibility to this. We even did a jacle of this. This is Catalina Mountains, but maybe you could share, you know, because it's a little different subject matter from what people may think of your work, but in my opinion, it's maybe one of the iconic images. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Tucson, and our family had 30 acres on River Road facing this very scene here uh, of the Catalina Mountains, mm -hmm. Finger Rock, and and very notable if, if you're around Tucson. So I, I decided I wanted to do my version mm. of this, my interpretation of, of this mountain, which is pretty iconic. There's probably been hundreds and hundreds of paintings done mm. of, this, of this mountain. So, so this is my take on it, and that this cactus really was in the, in the scene here. So, yeah. Uh, Does it have any other symbolic kind of sensibility? I mean, a loner, a single person in the West? No, just... My design, it does when I sell it. Though. My design sense. Uh, yeah, no, it really works. I, I mean, it that kind there. of just, without it, I don't think it works as well, interestingly enough. And to be honest with you, the, the color of the sky and uh, over these mountains usually is not this this blue. This is my personal uh, yeah, favorite yeah. I've seen kind of blue. Yeah. So It's beautiful. Uh, I love this painting. I think so. it's a great one. It's in the show. So let's keep moving. There's a lot of great pieces in here. <clears throat> Oh, we should talk about this, Howard, just because I know it seems like the problem is every painting we stop at, I go, oh, let's talk about this because it's all different. But, you know, I love the red barns. You see it in some of your paintings. You know, when I, I they're, they're the easiest to sell, it seems like. I don't know why they did, but tell us a little bit about this composition. Yeah, what first attracted me to this uh, thing was the, the big dynamic tree against the, the building here, and that, that's where I started my... Uh, sketches and so forth and uh, I then added the horse and the chickens later uh, mm. but uh, this was the initial impetus that got me interested mm. in this. Um, and for uh, those of you who might not know 
Howard actually, you know, he still raises chickens. Those are Maryland. She does, <laughs> does all the work as wife. But he also was a real cowboy. He's had horses all his life, including his father who owned, you know, a feed store, bum post place. So, you know, this is, you know, you're a real Arizonian, you know, multi-generational Arizonian. And uh, I think it shows in his paintings. I really do. It's, yeah. This is the kind of scene that I grew up around. Yes. You know, but uh, it's, I couldn't take you to this place. It's not an actual place. Part of it is yeah. in it's my right mind. Here yeah. And here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, but uh, I was pleased with it, and I think it's one of my wife's favorites. And yeah, that's a good um, one. I think this one was actually in the um, show that Tucson Museum of Art, wasn't it? Um, Might have been. I've seen this the image becomes so iconic. You just don't even really yeah. remember where all it's been. I, yeah, my wife wants it to be in her collection in her house. So uh, <laughs> it'll probably happen then. We'll have Let's, to. <laughs> we better keep moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Before she jumps in and grabs one. I want to do this one again? Yep. Uh, now we'll just keep moving down. This, this was a little different one that you did. I think maybe talk just a little bit about that because it's a chamisa. Yeah, I. Um, you know, we travel up through the Santa Fe area a lot, and I've seen these. Things yes, all over, and uh, I'm not sure what prompted me. This paint, painting goes back quite a way, so I can't remember exactly. Mm. But I, I love this bush, you know, and the design quality, the color, and everything. And this, this is my attempt to capture the essence of that chamisa bush. Yeah, it's great. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's again. I use this word, and it keeps coming to me because it's so definitive and descriptive it is has an iconic sensibility of the west yeah you know of the southwest especially these are if you go to santa fe these are those the hills yes on the way in from the south it's, yeah this is a beautiful painting and this is out of a private collection <clears throat> and again you know it's got the barns it's got the horses it's got the clouds would you consider this to be kind of the when you're putting all those elements of the West together, this kind of incorporates it all? Yeah, we, we got it all. We can even throw in the kitchen sink here somewhere. <laughs> but, <laughs> Probably but, in the barn. No. This is uh, based on a trip from Jackson Hole, mm. uh, these buildings and, and the corrals. That, and uh, I've uh, interpreted it, rearranged them a little bit. But uh, 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 yeah, it's got all the elements I love. I, my favorite icons of the West are the mm. horse and the fence. Yes. And uh, so uh, I'm happy when I get those in. But adding the buildings was fun. Yes. And, uh, and the verticality. You know, so many artists I see don't mm. do vertical pieces because it's hard to really capture, I think, sometimes the, the enormity of the West. And you're a guy who will do vertical paintings. I, I, if you look around at my, a lot of my pieces end up being vertical. Yes. I, I like that format uh, a lot. I also like the extreme horizontal ones, not just, mm. not just the... Uh, yeah, very narrow yeah, and long, yeah, yes. I yeah. like those. Yeah. Uh, it kind of pushes you a little bit to, mm -hmm. in your design. So. One of the things I've found, just <clears throat> if you see a post, you can be you know, across the room because of the colors, because of the size format, you can immediately pick out your paintings. And I've often said this, you're a real colorist and nobody can kind of really do what you do because we see the colors in a different way that most people do. Yeah. If people ask me, how do you get that color? I can't tell them. Yeah, you know, that's why they can't fake it. Because <laughs> I uh, just follow my gut on the color. You know? Yeah, it's an innate, it's an innate yeah. thing. Talking about fence posts, there's one that's kind of snuck around the back as you first come in the exhibit. And we're right now we're here. They're setting up. They're getting, getting ready for the party and all that. We've got boxes and stuff around. But when you look at this particular painting, for me, that's a really a modernist sense. And do you feel something kind of differently when you have done something like this? I mean, very simple, but you know, it's all about lines and yeah. you know, structure. I was telling somebody yesterday that this may be one of the only pieces that I uh, set up a still life kind of thing. Mm. I I set this up. Mm. I uh, I always enjoy the rhythms of the fence posts and the stays, these are not the major poles, these are the ones that go in between. Mm. So I went out to a friend's ranch and he had a big stack of these laying there on mm. the ground. So I, I picked them up, and took, went over against the fence and did kind of a random arrangement of them. So this this is my arrangement of these mm. fence posts here, uh, yes. looking for that. It's kind of a, yeah, a modernistic, abstract quality that, well, I, very much so. that I like. and uh, and. Uh, 
you, you wouldn't see that in the fencing, really. You know, these would be spaced out. Right. And uh, I think the title of the piece is uh, tomorrow's, For Tomorrow's Fence. Crew. Right. So they would take these stays and put them every uh, four feet. Yeah, so it could be that way, yeah, actually. So, but so this is my personal arrangement of these. Uh, yeah, and the, the abstract quality is what I like about this piece. Have you strung Bob R? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a laugh. That's, that's a joke because that means yes, many yeah. times and many yeah. conditions. Yeah. So it's, not many of the artists have actually strung Bob R. They're allowed to do this when they've strung Bob R yeah. themselves. <laughs> One of my least favorite things as growing up was Let's string you stre up. stretching fence, you know. So. It's hard. Yeah. You get Na cut, right? Nasty, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. No, I get it. I tried to avoid that as a kid. <coughs> Some of the local rancher kids, oh, yeah, come help us string bob wire. And I'm like, oh, is it fun? Oh, yeah, you'll like it. <laughs> no, not fun. Trust me. <laughs> so this painting, wow, what a ma that's a major painting. I don't think I've ever seen this piece. What's, what's the story on this? <clears throat> This is a commission I did for a fellow named Elmore Johnson, who's a longtime resident of uh, this town here. Yeah. He's, well, he's a, I think it was an attorney out of Chicago. They had yes. a home fair for years, and he, he, they commissioned this for home. This, they were nice enough. He's passed away, but his wife mm -hmm. was nice enough to loan it to the, beautiful for the painting. show. Beautiful Yeah, beautiful, um, beautiful painting. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so, and this is a, size that's a little bigger than you would normally yeah, work in it. Normally. Well, back in the day, I did quite a few of this size here. Yes. And uh, I can't remember if they had any input on what they wanted in the, the content of the painting, but... Uh, if you took the horses out, there's a Maynard Dixon done in 1935. It has the <laughs> same kind of sensibility, yeah. which I'm sure you never saw, but, you know, it's... And uh, who was he now? Yeah, it's, uh, he's an unknown artist. <laughs> so we'll uh, keep moving on to... And so this is the first one of really cowboys that are um, the big major component. Often it seems like when I look at your paintings, they're almost incidental to what is going on. But you can't get away from this as being, this yeah. is about them. Yeah, this piece is, uh, I'm going to say about 1990, maybe. In the, uh, yeah. I <clears throat> really like, th this is the format I enjoy this long. Yes. Ver as horizontal and uh, um, you can see the brush stroke is a lot looser and more expressionistic yes during that period I was that was pretty typical of my work back then yes in fact and, I can recognize an early piece by yeah, that yeah. kind of more impressionistic yeah. sensibility I, uh, I'll have to say one of my favorite parts of this painting is, is this landscape in the back of these mm. hills that are pretty abstract and, and uh, and what's the single horse that they're bringing out? Uh, when you're, these are probably ropers, or they could be ranchers, but you, you pony a horse to get him exercise. Yes. When he's, he's not well enough to put a saddle on and ride, so mm -hmm. somebody leads him to get him called legged up, or mm -hmm. get him in shape, you know. Yes. To, so he'll be used in a future time, so. Yeah, that's a beautiful painting. I'm glad they picked that one for the show because one I haven't seen it. It's actually in the yeah permanent collection of the Tucson Museum of Art. Oh, they must not show that one very often then. They, they, you know, it's interesting. Tucson Museum of Art probably has as many paintings of yours as anybody in their permanent collection. Yeah. I, I actually t had them take it out because I wanted to pay to get it reframed. Ah, I wasn't happy with whoever put it in. Owned the frame. It was I owned the painting and had a yes a frame I didn't care for so yeah if you yeah. ever go to Tucson Museum of Art I think they must have six of your paintings in I it. think so yeah so you know they'll show them to you if you go Christine Brinza is there she's always happy to you know the Glasser family who are major contributors to the museum yes uh, own a major Launch. part of those yes so I, I don't, yeah uh, they donated them yeah yeah no they're great that's a great collection so here's <laughs> again one of the I would call that sense of you know, when I see something like this, I, you know, I grew up in this kind of environment. So, but, you know, I see a story and, but you feel the, to me, the immensity of what the West is. Yeah. I don't know if that is anything you feel when you do this or. I wasn't looking for that. I, uh, this piece is only a couple of years old. Yeah, I know. And, uh, uh, I love the intricacies of 
it's almost like a puzzle, you know. To, yeah, to, it is. To solve, yeah. which my wife wouldn't be surprised by because I hate doing puzzles. But <laughs> this, I enjoyed this. And the, there used to be these kind of stockyards and right. all over the West, but not so many anymore. There is this, I borrowed the reference of the Fort Worth stockyard, right. which are pretty famous. Now you can walk up on a catwalk above these. And so I borrowed that reference to do this painting. Definitely the hills and so forth are not. Yeah, and it's got all the little numbers yeah, too, right? Yeah, the pens are all numbered. And uh, and uh, so I enjoyed doing that one for that reason. I think, it's the, I think it's what you just said for me, why I get this kind of sense of isolation and loneliness, whatever it is. Because when we go to where I'm from in eastern New Mexico, you'll see again these kind of dotted everywhere. Some are still functional, but almost yeah. all of them are not. They're just kind of in disrepair. So 80% of the time, they're nothing going on with them. They're yeah. just sitting there right. waiting for the the uh, gathering of the cattle. And, right. and uh, then they'll make arrangements with the neighbors or hire guys to come and get ready to load the cattle. You know? mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, most of the time they're they're pretty lonely when you drive around the west and see them. There's yeah. nothing going on. So. Yeah, no, this is a wonderful piece. It really is. Um, and then let's just move to this. Maybe this kind of the last piece we'll talk about. Again, this is an earlier piece. Um, you, you, you've got the imagery of the more impressionistic. And so that's a new painting. This is what probably 1990 to 1995. Yeah, I say 90. Yeah. So how has from that piece that was basically brand new, a couple a year old, to this, which is you know 30 years old, you still see the stockyards puzzle, but it, there is a different sensibility, I guess, in my eye. Do you see any difference from that one to this one? I, I see the uh, paint quality is, is different. The application of the paint, it's yes. a lot thicker and juicier and more ab expressionistic on yes. the paint. Uh, <coughs> I I can't get over this fixation on corrals, so yeah. it's stayed with me for yes. 40 years, you know, yeah. so I keep coming back to it uh, one way or another. You know. Why do you think that is? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I need a shrink to yeah, figure that no. out. I mean, there's something there. I mean, you grew up around them, your dad, uh, and you did a lot of work and probably had a lot of fun, too. Yeah, we had uh, wood corrals that were always being broken and damaged, and my assignment usually was to go out and patch those. Uh -huh. You know, and we, didn't, we didn't build new fence. We just right. took another piece and patched it so you're onto the old you're one. Still you know? them. You're still patching them. You're still so in that process. So uh, early on, I probably found I liked that uh, quality of the corrals. You know, and there's a, there is an artistic component of patching yeah. corrals, right? Yeah. Now more that. corrals are my the ones I have in my own place are metal pipe. You know, yeah. so and and I've done paintings of those as well, but yeah. they're not quite as uh, fun for me. Yeah, you know. it seems like they're um, usually these wooden well, corrals. Kind of, again, I, I, had, I say, you know, co going back to that earlier time of childhood in the West and what it is, I don't, you know, maybe that's a subconscious thing or something I'm yeah. just reading into it that isn't yeah. there. I don't know. I just like the design qualities of the yeah. linear quality yes. of the fences. Uh, yeah. I like railroad tracks too, yeah. you know, and <laughs> the, the fields, the hay fields when they're yeah. just plowing the new rows. I've done Quite a few paintings of that. Yes, uh, I, I love the linear qualities yes. of that. Yes, very uh, good. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to add about this retrospective? What does it feel like to, you know, you've got this retrospective here, and you're being honored at the Booth Museum, and you know, two months. What does it feel like at 75 to? I, I'm a little seven? worried they're doing it because they <laughs> they might think that he's not going to be around much longer. You know? <laughs> so, so, but. Uh, it's, it's an honor for sure. Yes. I, I appreciate it. Uh, yes. Anytime someone uh, uh, shows that they like your work, and, and yeah. uh, that's, you can't beat that, you know. No. So it is an honor. I, I yeah. appreciate it. It's yeah. an honor for me to be here, too, yeah. and getting to do this. Honestly, my career wouldn't have been what it is if I didn't have, if Howard Post hadn't started, you know, joining my gallery as the first really major artist, he and Ray Roberts, you know, about 1996. And without that, I probably wouldn't have, you know, done as good. In fact, I'm sure I wouldn't have. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's it's been a fun ride for all, both of us, I guess. Well, let me say too, I, my career has been benefited greatly by people like you that have, have you. really taken an interest in my work and made it happen. You know, I love your without work. you guys, uh, yeah. uh, I wouldn't have been able to achieve what I have with yeah. it. So, well, thank you. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, if you have a chance, come to Desert Caviaris and see it. 
If this is 40 years later, I hope it still resonates for those people who are watching it. So it happens that in Wickenburg, this time of year, there's all these ropers that come out, and it's this huge thing. And I had never gone to this specific kind of rodeo event where they're roping only. I've been to lots of rodeos, been to the finals a couple of times in Vegas. But this was uh, Howard and myself sitting in stands in Wickenburg watching from not great ropers to great ropers and just him giving me a sense of what it is, because this is what Howard did, right? I mean, he won major awards, major, you know, um, prizes for his roping skills. So he really knows it as a specialist. And you have to think about when you have an artist like Howard Post who paints these things that really culturally are sensitive and hits home with him, we're getting to the basis of what that is, which is rodeo, and in this case, roping, which was his sport. So he really talks about that. And I don't know if anybody's ever done that with Howard. So a different podcast for sure but one that I really enjoyed and learned a lot, especially about roping. So the top 20 come back for the short round, they call it. Yes. And that's where the money is in the, the, the top. You want to get, so if you were really fast, but then miss the next one, you're out, you know, so consistency. Consistency pays. So when you watch these guys, can you tell immediately, oh, they got it or not? Uh, they were a good team. He, he just had a bad moment there, you know. Yeah. Do you know that team? No, oh, but you, you tell can tell by the the technique. And, was, uh, were people all scared of you when you came up? Because they go, <laughs> "Oh, he's one." That's Howard Post up no, there. No. Not especially not the last ten years. You know, he's an old geezer. You know. <laughs> he's an old geezer. That was good. So if you only catch Plus one five, leg, that's a five-second penalty. Oh. If you want to catch two feet. <coughs> a, a good run would be eight seconds. Yes. If you had four or eight seconds run, you're going to win a, a bunch of money. You know. So. Yeah, and what's a uh, world-class well, winning? Well, at the uh, finals where the pros rope in, in Vegas, a uh, whole different format. They use a, a real small okay, arena and short. And there'll be three or four seconds. Yes. On those. Wow. That's a pretty good run. Yeah, that's good. So he's riding a, a, he's riding a mule. That's really unusual. Next time wow. Be that's really unusual, isn't it? So the people that are at this, is it a, a lot of these just ranchers yeah. that are also enjoy this kind of activity? Yeah, they're not doing it for a living. This is a, right. this is a sport, you know, like golf or, yeah. or uh, motocross or something like that. Yeah. And then a lot of this, too, would be, I mean, these are working ranchers that they use this still in their, what they do as a yeah. job, right? Yeah, a lot, of them, a lot of them have never been on a ranch, you know, so, yeah. Uh, but, but this sport came from ranching, so in, in the old days out on the range when you needed the doctor and cow, yeah. one guy would rope his head and the other his feet and he'd stretch it down and yes. then go doctor and you know, that's that's what it, where it came from. So, and so they, put, they put protective gear on the steer's head so it doesn't hurt, hurt them, you know. Yeah. So. And are these... Brad, just for doing this? Yeah, they're Corrientes. Uh -huh. They came from Mexico originally. They have good horns on them. And they're, yes. And they're not particularly wild and crazy, you know. Right. Uh, so they're bred for this sport. Well, they weren't, but they, they found that they were came naturally to it, you know. So. Yes. But some guys raised that. Those guys, my friends there in Queen Creek, they raised Corrientes, but they started in Mexico. Wow, they just have them going and going, don't they? Yeah, they keep it running fast. Really fast. There's a second arena over there. If you did good here, you just go over to that next one and run your next one. So you run one here, then you go to the next arena? Yeah, if you do there, you do it. Your third one, and then when they're all done, they bring back the top 20 that go right here. And this, is, this is where the money is. Yes. And you have to do three of these, right? Three good ones to maybe qualify for the fourth one. Oh, okay. So when they miss one like that, at that point they're just trying they're to. No get, so out. it's a no time. Yeah. Does that mean you're not going to be in the money yeah, anyway? You're out. They don't get. They don't get the second one. So it goes one, two, three. Yeah. 
I've been banging for Indians. Oh, boy, the Indians are really good at this you know, off the reservation, the, the Navajos. They, yes, they've taken to this. And they, yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize, but cowboys are a big percent of Native Americans are cowboys and people of color, and they have been forever. Yeah. You know, they don't, I think it's a misnomer people don't understand it. It's, you know, it's as much as their heritage as anybody else's. So these are handicapped, meaning uh, like oh. golf, you know? Yeah. So uh, they're numbered. You get a number from one to 10. Yeah, yes. Eight, eight through 10 is pro level. Uh, the vast majority of ropers are five, which is what I was, just a, a competent yes. amateur, you know? Yes. And so if this roping, I know it may be a 10 roping, that means two fives would rope in this one. Yes. But a, a seven or an eight could not rope in one of these roping. They wouldn't be allowed to rope wouldn't be allowed. Looks like we got a lot of threes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are. <laughs> guys, so are guys that are just learning. Right. Usually about a three or a four, you know. I, the thing that really I find amazing is that there's no break. I mean, it just. Yeah, they keep it running fast. And they do this through. They have a, through their iPhone, right? You're, they know yeah. when they're supposed to come yeah. up? Well, they have a list posted, but they send it to you on your phone. So is the trailer the hardest yeah. job? The healer, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's hardest. Yeah. I would think so, right? It's the timing of... You have to be perfect. You have to, it's when the feet come up, you have to deliver your loop. And what was, what was your position? I did both, actually. Uh-huh. I won by truck as a healer. Yeah. Uh, but I've, I've won a bunch heading as well. And so the person that, did you work with somebody for a long, long time? Certain partners, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you want to get a, obviously get a good partner that you're comfortable with. And I want a, a guy that lives in Wickenburg here was my best partner. We won several places. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so, um, what do you look for as far as, you know, I would think some, some of the cows, these are steers? Steers, yeah. Some, there you go. Nice. So some of the steers are just easier. Yeah, that one was pretty slow. Yeah, right, he didn't do, I mean, that seemed like they got a, the, the draw of the yeah, great steer. Right? the luck of the draw, they yeah. call it. Some run really hard and some yeah. are slower. <coughs> and do you, do you look at that in the steer before you go, go, okay, I think it's gonna be a runner? Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell, unless you've seen them. Or a turner, like that guy. Yeah. There you go, they got it. That's a yeah, good run. That's good. So, you're gonna be in 868, so my partner, my good partner, so there's a danger of dallying, so you rope it and then you take a turn around the saddle horn yes. to hold it. And uh, when that, if that slips or you miss it, it'll cut off your fingers or something. Wow. So my good partner, he, he lost his thumb one year that he learned to read how to rope between, the between these fingers. The tips of two fingers, and he can—he still ropes. He learned how to do it. So, so he lost three fingers, but yeah. he's still going. I got a big scar right there where I caught one. Yeah, it was close to. Yeah. That mirror off. Yeah. What did Marilyn have to say about that? Since you paint for a living, yeah. she probably I, wasn't I, too I happy practiced. With that. I could paint. <laughs> you would art, yeah. You were already practicing yeah. that way. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, because I mean, it has. That's a good rope. So you have to. I mean, as a professional artist, and you're doing this for 50 years, I mean, you're taking risks every time, right? Because yeah. yeah, it can happen, yeah. right? I'm pro it sounds like, at least to one partner, it happened three different times. Yeah, if you go through here, guys that have been doing a long time, there's a lot of missing thumbs. Yeah. But I, I've also practiced painting left-handed, too. <laughs> Just in case. Yeah. And is it the healer that has the... 
the yeah. risk of that? Yeah, usually the healer. Yeah. Because uh, there's tears going away, the horse is stopping, and that's yes. going slide through your hand. Wow. Yeah. Learning curve, is that pretty big? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So most of it's like these little kids running around with their rope, yeah, and that's when you learn too, right? Just, you know, I, have a, I have a friend that made a, got wealthy in, a, in business, decided he wanted to be a roper. Yes. So on day one, he went to a pro and he bought four of the best horses available, and then he took lessons. Yes. And he practiced twice a day, every day for three years. Uh -huh. And he got competent enough to. Come compete, and compete, you know. And how did he do? He, and he's won quite a bit. He's still wow. He's still only a five, but it, yeah. It, but it, that's it, like it, in a handicap of golf. Yeah. It's probably equivalent to being a five yeah. handicap at golf, maybe. Yeah. Wow, that looks guy just looks good. Gonna be in no time. No time. You look good though. So they got all these sponsors pre for it. That's the, they make the gates. And, yeah. And they got uh, rope sponsors. And, Wow. And then I'm assuming that most of these guys probably have some shoulder issues too, right? They're the ropers, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty common thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's that's what I like everything about it except, like everything about it except losing the finger part. <laughs> that part I don't really. Yeah. That part doesn't <laughs> seem so much. Yeah, that's uh, interestingly the guys who've lost them they they'll find them out in the arena and they will pick them up and they can go to a surgeon and have yeah, them connect it but they use they don't work as well they don't work so they usually just take them off yeah so i guess if you're in wickenburg and you're thinking about doing hand surgery as a profession you probably be doing pretty good in this town yeah. at least in the winter months yeah i yeah. don't know about the summer months so yeah. and and so they do this from what period? I mean, there's hundreds of people here. Yeah. How often was it starting like January and go through like March? The summer months, they shut it no, down yeah. here. Everybody goes north. Right. You know, but so, yeah, it'll be through March at least. You know. Yeah, and they start in January or so? Uh, before that. Before that. So, oh. Cooked around his horse. So he was whipping his horses. We've we'll got cut under the horse's tail. I guess you learn as a partner to, when your partner does something like that, which is, yeah, that's, not, that's not a good one, but I guess you learn to go, well, that's part of the game. So the key is the start here. So yeah. the steers have a, like a, just a fraction head start. Yes. And, but if you're let them way out there, then they're going to go. You that was a good start. Yeah. They should be able to nail that one. Right. If, they, bra if they break the barrier, start too fast, there's a bell rings and you get a five second penalty. So like that guy only caught one leg, yeah. that's a five second yeah. penalty. Yeah. But that can still keep them in the money yeah. if they do the other two? Uh, in a big rope, in the, they, you wouldn't be in place with a leg. Yeah. So, so with a lot of competitors, basically, you have to get a time three times in a row, period, or you're yeah. out, right? Yeah. There's a lot of people out. Yeah. yeah, so if they, if they start with 200 teams after the first round, there will be 150 left. Yeah. And then after the next round, they're down to 100. Yes. So, uh, and so is this, do you think this is the beginning of the... I think this must be the beginning of the world. Right. And so by the mid-afternoon, it'll be whittled down to, yeah. what, 50 people? But they have more than one division roping, so they'll, they'll do one division like they would say in the number 11 and uh, then they finish that one then they'll do a number 12 yeah you know and uh, do you think most of these people just do it for the sheer love because it's yeah. you're not really going to make much money and there's so much cost and time with the cattle that's a good yeah. rope you know yeah that's the cost your goal is just to break, break even. even. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's more about the Western tradition <laughs> yeah, yeah. of roping, right, and rodeo. I mean, I had an arena at my house, and I bought ten steers to practice on. Yes, those are six hundred apiece. Yes, you know, a good horse is twenty grand. I yes, three horses, saddles, uh, those trailers. Those are two hundred grand minimum. For yes, you know, the, the truck trailers. Yeah. So, and the time. Yeah, the time. Because yeah. every time you're out practicing, 
That's yeah. one less painting that's getting made. I would get guys that <laughs> most of the guys have jobs, so I'd have to after they were done working. Yes, say, we'd go out. And I built an arena that had lights, so we'd practice at night. But I find it interesting, you know, you did this forever, and yet I've never, I don't think you've ever done a painting of a, you know, commercial painting for a gallery that's of ropers. Never have, right? I don't, I don't have any interest in, I got tons of photos of me roping. Yes. And I don't have any interest in yeah. doing a painting of that. Or any rodeo scene yeah. other than them sitting on a fence, right? Yeah. Why is that, do you think? That one I did for you of the bull rider, yes. you know, that you have that, that may be one of two or three that I've ever done. Yes. And that was done specifically because we did a rodeo show. Yeah. But why do you think it is you don't want, even though you know it intimately, you can tell me every aspect of this, what it takes, mm -hmm. importance, but yet you don't capture that. You don't have any desire to capture that. I find it a little trite because there's photos. You're imitating a photo, you know, yeah. I don't know. I like, I like the aspect, it's a fine motor skill to try to, I don't want to be the healer. They say it's the most intricate thing So there's five elements. There's one steer, two horses, two riders that all have to click. The ballet. You know, I have to click, you know. And so what's, he's calling if they have a, he's, he's, so the time starts on a computer. Yes, right at the gate, but he's the one that signals when yeah. they stop the time. They so there's a the time. That's a pretty good time. They have to face. They have to come around and face each other. That's, that was a good run. There. Yeah. <clears throat> he judges if it's a if you have a foot in the head catch, it's illegal. If, if you have the rope figure eight, and that's illegal. So he judges. He's watching all of he that. He judges that. That's a girl right there. A lot of girls are really good at this. What's the youngest you see people out here doing? You get kids out here that are well, and yeah, roping. And these are open ones in the, the World Series. It's an 18. You have to be 18 to yeah. qualify for Vegas. So, but I've seen 10-year-old. Uh, yeah. What's the famous, the most famous ropers that you know? Um, Speed Williams was an eight-time world champion. Wow. He makes his living doing podcasts and training. Yeah. <coughs> so they all do uh, online training now, you know, and have... Uh -huh. you, yeah, it's a sport. You, you pay to get trained, like golf videos, you know, yes. like the same thing. One of my best friends who lived next to me in Queen Creek was a two-time world champion. Wow. Matt Sherwood. Do you ever rope with him? Yeah. Nice family guy. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he went on the road two years because it's, it's a brutal life. They're traveling. I would think. Constantly and uh, expenses. Yes. And uh, he won like 300000 one year, you know. And, uh, and then if you get sponsors, that's where you make some money. But. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you do this because it's an American yeah. sport. Yeah. yeah. It's your history. It's your culture. And you like it. I get it. Yeah. You're not doing it for the money. So the Indians up there, they that's all they do up on the res is uh, practice team roping. You know, there's a couple champion Navajos. That, yeah, I see a lot of Diné in the audience today. Well, I now know all about roping. Now can we go learn about Mexican food? Yeah. <laughs>